Well, welcome. Welcome. I am Pam Curnow. I am the teaching director for the Castle Rock CBS class, and I am so glad that you have chosen to join me this year virtually. Um, it, it, one of the blessings of holding a virtual class is that when days like this, our first snowstorm of the year, but we don't have to have snow days. We don't have to close for snow days. We can still hold class, and it's a wonderful time to be able to get together. So um, on this first um, snow day of the season, grab a blanket, a cup of hot chocolate, and open your Bible, and we will begin looking at the Gospel of John. That's our study this year. Now, through the inspired words of God and the testimony of the Apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, you and I will go deep into the greatest words ever recorded, the words of Jesus that has the power to transform lives, to renew minds, to ignite faith and love. God's word has the power to bring peace in the midst of all of our troubled times. And isn't that what we need right now? Exactly what we need right now. We need peace and we need hope and we need transformation. But before we begin to look at John 1, I want to share something about going deep. Um, it's an illustration about what we find in the ocean in God's creation. So there's a part of the sea known as the cushion of the sea. It lies deep beneath um, the waters, the turbulent, um, agitated forces where there's storms and such. And it's uh, well below the turning of the wind. It's so deep that it's a part of the sea that is never touched. Um, it's never stirred, no matter what the power of the storm is that goes above. But when that ocean floor in the very de deep places is dredged, if all the remains of the planet or the animal life, it reveals evidence of having remained completely undisturbed for hundreds, if not thousands years. And it's called the cushion of the sea. So I think in the Gospel of John that we are going to go deep, deep into the places of God. We're going to go uh, into the depth of God's word, the place that it brings peace, the peace of God that it brings that eternal calm that is unlike no other. It um, lies so deep within the human heart, and it's only nourished by the power of God's word that no external difficulty or disturbances can reach it. And anyone who enters into the presence of God will experience that undisturbable um, calmness and peace of God. So that's my prayer this year, is that we will experience such a peace as we enter into God's presence. So now let me open us in prayer as we turn to chapter one of the Gospel of John. So Father, I just ask you that you would show us through your Holy Spirit, just who you are. As we begin to see who Jesus Christ is, the word, and we get to go deep into your word that brings life, that brings peace, that brings your presence. Father, I pray that each and every one who listens to this message today would feel the presence of God, would know the peace of God, that their lives would indeed be transformed. And so, Father, I pray these things in the precious and the most powerful name of all, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So now open your Bible to John 1, the Gospel of John, and we're going to have three different divisions. And I don't know yet how to put that up on the screen, so you just have to bear with me. But the first division is that Jesus Christ is the Word. He is eternal. And we see this in John 1, 1 through 2, but we're going to look through John 1, 1 through 5 throughout this time. So as we study the claims of Jesus and the life of Jesus and the miracles of Jesus and the words of Jesus, we will study the word, which is Jesus Christ. He is and he was from the very beginning. He was with God and he was God. It is the word who made all things, who is the life and the light of men, who is Jesus Christ. But before we jump right into that, Let's look a little bit more at who the author or the one who penned this book, the Gospel of John, who he was and what the main message of the book is. So the <laughs> at home you have disturbances. So I quickly saw what was going on outside the door and I've got this dog that is crazy. So anyway, he's going to settle down. Um, we're going to be just fine. But let me come back into this again. Um, so we're we're going to learn a little bit more who penned the book, uh, the Gospel of John. So that was the Apostle John. He 
is the one who penned the Gospel of John, and and the main message of the book is salvation. But Apostle John, he is or was the son of Zebedee and Salome. He was the younger brother of James. And Jesus described both James and John as the sons of thunder. That indicated their character when they first met Jesus. So now the word, Jesus Christ, has the power to transform lives. And John's life is proof of that because it was dramatically transformed. He was changed from an impetuous, self-centered, hot-tempered young man into a loving and wise man of God, the one whom Jesus loved. So then John becomes a disciple of, of uh, John the Baptist. He left a thriving fishing um, enterprise in the hands of his brother James, and he followed John the Baptist into the wilderness. As John the Baptist proclaimed the message, prepare the way, Israel, prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And then one day, one day, John met Jesus, and he saw the long-awaited anointed one, Jesus Christ, and he looked um, He looked at him. He knew that he was the Messiah, although Jesus didn't look anything like he had expected or imagined. But he found in him the truth that he was indeed the Messiah. Now, John was the longest living apostle, and it's believed that he was close to the age of 90 when he wrote the Gospel of John. He lived long enough to see it all from the beginning of Jesus's earthly ministry all the way through the vision of revelation to the end. And so he spent three years with Jesus. And those few years just flew by, but they remained vivid and in his memory. And so when he was in Ephesus, then he wrote the Gospel of John. He watched Jesus live and he watched Jesus love and he listened to him teach and to preach. And he thought that Jesus would be that super David, the conquering super David, the savior of Israel. And yet he watched the Messiah stripped and beaten. And he stood at the cross as Jesus hung from it. John saw the sky darkened as the light of the world faded into death. And then he saw his hope resurrected to assume a more glorious form than he ever could have imagined. and the. And this all John records in the Gospel of John. Now, the primary purpose of the Gospel of John is found in um, chapter 20 of John, verse 31. And it says this, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. It is a salvation message. It is a glorious message of what Jesus Christ has done as he walked in the flesh on the earth for us. So the audience and the message in each of the four de- um, Gospels, it differs. Um, so they're, they're reaching different audiences in each one of them. If you look at the Gospel of Matthew, it was written to a Jewish audience. And the primary theme in it was, this is the Messiah, the King, now worship him. In the Gospel of Mark, it would have appealed to the Romans in the present um Romans, and it presents Christ's ministry from a practical, action-oriented point of view. And Mark says that this is the servant who served humility, humanity. Now follow him. And then Luke, he wrote the Gospel of Luke uh, to common Greeks, and he favored the title Son of Man. And Luke says to us, this is the only man among men without sin. Now emulate him. And now John. John announces that Jesus Christ is the Word, the creator of all things, the life and the light, God in human flesh. And he calls out to all, believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. That is the message of the Gospel of John. So now let's open the Word to John 1, and we will find the proof that substantiates the claim that indeed Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So. Our first division, Jesus Christ is the Word, the Eternal One, John 1, 1 through 5. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
This is the most profound truth in all of the universe. John's spirit-inspired words convey the truth beyond the ability of the greatest minds in human history to even fathom. The eternal, the infinite God became man. He became man in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In eternity past, before the beginning of anything, space, time, or matter, in the indefinite expansion of the timeless existence, in the very beginning that had no beginning, the Word was already in existence. The Word is eternal. He had no beginning, and He will have no end. The Word is God. For God, only God, is eternal. So then we can render verse 1 and 2 in this manner. We can say this. We can say, in the beginning that had no beginning was the eternal word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning that had no beginning. Amazing, amazing. Now look at me at the verb that is translated was. The Greek meaning of that word was describes a continuing action in the past. It means to be. So a literal interpretation of John's first sentence would be, in the beginning, the word was existing. John carefully, he carefully crafted these initial sentences to establish an essential truth. He chose them so that there would be no misunderstanding. Before any conceivable point in the eternity past was already uh, the word, Jesus Christ was already existing. The word has always existed. And later in verse 14, we learn that the word is Jesus Christ, who we know. Now, the word uh, logos, it's uh, the concept of it is one that is filled with meaning for both Jews and for Greeks. They both understood it. The Greek philosophers would have heard the word logos, that it referred to um, uncreated, a divine mind that gives meaning and order to the universe. He's both a creative force, but he's also the source of, source of all wisdom. So to the Greeks then, John presented Jesus as the personification in the embodiment of the Logos, of the Word. But to the Jews, Logos was far more than just a philosophical um, concept. The Word of the Lord was the expression of divine power and wisdom. John presented Jesus to the Jewish readers as the incarnation of the divine power and revelation, which is God. God manifested his glory himself in the flesh of Jesus Christ, in in Christ who walked um, among us. So um, um, going on into the verses, and the word was with God. So with God, that just It just describes or represents a closeness and intimacy. The word Jesus Christ and God the Father, they existed closely together, sharing place and intimacy and purpose. The word is a person, not an attribute of God, nor was he a creation of the Father God. And yet he has the same essence as the Father. All that is true of God is also true of the word. Jesus Christ. Psalm 90 verse 2 says that ever, um, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now that word everlasting in the Hebrew means to hide. So if an object moves farther and farther away from your you as an observer, it eventually vanishes from sight. It's beyond the vanishing point, but it still exists. So let's paraphrase for uh, Psalm 90 verse 2 like this. From the vanishing point to the, from, okay, let's try that one more time. Psalm 90 verse 2. From the vanishing point in the past to the vanishing point in the future, you have existed, Lord. And yet, and yet, you guys, in an amazing act of divine love, Jesus left the glory of heaven and privilege and willingly emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient, even to the point of death, even death on the cross. That is the word that was with God. And now the word was God. And John's description of the word reaches its height 
in the statement that the word was God. That simple statement, it perhaps is the clearest and the most direct declaration of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ to be found anywhere in the scriptures. Not only did the word exist from all eternity and have face-to-face fellowship with God the Father, but the word was God. An amazing thought just blows you away. So Jesus Christ, Logos, the word, is the manifestation in the flesh of the glory of God the Father. He is eternal. He has no beginning and he has no end. He was with God in the beginning that had no beginning, and he is God. The truth of Jesus Christ's deity and full equality with the Father, it is a non-negotiable element to the Christian faith. Because it's only through God's only Son, Jesus Christ, that we can enter into the depth of God. It's only through the Son that we can experience the peace of God and the peace in God, the peace with God and the peace in God. So Jesus Christ is God. Believe in him and you will be saved. Now going into our second division, the word is the creator. All things were made through him, specifically verses one through three is what we're looking at. But again, in the beginning that has no beginning was the eternal word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The word is the creator. John states that the word is deity, and then he makes the case from the standpoint of time. Only God can be eternal, and because the word is eternal, then he is God. So now in verse 3, he establishes the deity of Christ from another perspective, and that's from creation. In the ancient mind, in the Hebrew and the Gentile mind, everything that existed or exists can be placed into two distinct categories, created and not created. Anything not created, that is anything that was not brought into being, is by definition God. So all things came into being through him and apart from him, Nothing came into being that has come into being. That is what John is saying. So he takes us back to eternity past, far beyond Genesis 1-1, to say that the Son of God was already existing, that he brought everything that exists into being. Now, why? Why is this point um, that the Word is God and that the Word is eternal, um, who brings in existence all things, why is it so very important? Well, it's important because there is false teaching out there. There's false teaching that claim that Jesus Christ is not God, that he is not co-equal, that he is not co-eternal, that he is not co-existent with the Father in eternity past. And many claim that Christ was the first created being, that the Father brought the Son into existence, and the Son then created everything else. But this is not true. It has false teaching. The scripture says, and John points directly to the moment of creation to say that before anything existed, Christ did, who is the creator who called all things into being. So he is God. He is God. Critical, foundational truth for Christianity. But let's bring this down to the personal piece of it as well. Because the word, Jesus Christ, is the creator. Oh, he has created you and he's created me. He fashioned each one of us in his mo- in our mother's womb. He knows our thoughts. He has numbered our days. Um, he says that we are his workmanship, created to do great things for his glory. And my friends, today he calls each of us to enter into the depth of his presence and his peace. You can trust the motivation of his heart because his motivation is love, pure and simple love. You can trust him with whatever you are going through right now. You can trust him to be peace in the midst of the turmoil, to bring um, hope in the midst where there's hopelessness, to, to infuse hope that brings you out of grief or despair. He is from everlasting to everlasting. 
He created all things and he created you. So believe in him and be saved. Believe in him and experience the peace with God and the peace of God. It knows no boundaries. His love knows no boundaries. It goes deep, go deep with him. So now that takes us into our third division. And that third division is the word is the source of life and light. And nothing remains alive apart from him, specifically out of verses four through eight. But we have to go from the beginning again. So starting in verse one, in chapter one, in the beginning, which had no beginning, was the eternal word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And now verse four, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Glorious passage. It's interesting because in verse four, in John's gospel, he does something that you don't find in any of the synoptic gospels in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Matthew traces Jesus's genealogy back to Abraham, and Luke traces his roots to the first human, which was Adam. But John, he reaches far beyond that, uh, before, far, far, <laughs> far beyond them to the creation of the universe. The creator spoke the universe into existence, and then he filled it with light, the light of his truth and the light of his presence. Jesus Christ is the life, and he is the light. Intellectually, light refers to truth and darkness to falsehood, and morally, Light refers to holiness and darkness to sin. God is light. He is holy and in them, him there is absolutely no darkness, no darkness whatsoever. Because darkness represents evil and evil or darkness cannot dwell within God. In him is life and light all motivated by love. His love is why he even sent the light of men, why he sent the light of men to in the flesh to die on the cross. Now, let me share you uh, share with you something that I found out about light that I thought was just really awesome. Dr. Robert Burpee was a recent guest on Focus on the Family, and he stated that um, that at conception there's a burst of light. At the moment of conception, there's a burst of light. Now, I searched through the Internet, and everyone knows the Internet is, is, is right on, spot on. So, and I found a number of articles that confirmed it, and I found an article that denied it. So take it or leave it. But I thought this was way cool. And this is what was reported by Teresa Woodruff, who is the director of the Women's Health Research Institute and the chief of the Division of the Obstet Obst Obst Obstetrics and gynecology fertility preservation at Northwestern University. Say that one three times fast. But this is what that is said, what was written in the article and then what she said. For the first time, reach, researchers have witnessed the exact moment conception occurs and have recorded the ensuing explosion of sparks that form when the sperm meets an egg. Scientists have previously captured this moment in animals but this is the first time it's been recorded in humans. Now she reports, and I quote, it was remarkable. We discovered the zinc spark just five years ago in the mouse, and now to see the zinc radiate out in a burst from a human egg was breathtaking. So you and I, the word, Jesus Christ, the creator of light and life, and of all creation, why wouldn't there be a burst of light at the time of conception. Oh, but God, an amazing thing. So now we have found powerful truths in just these first five verses of the Gospel of John. Clearly, Jesus Christ is God. He is the eternal Word of God. He is the creator of all things, and He is the source of life and light. How can we deny that? How can we? The only hope for all of mankind, for all that we see going on, is the source of light. It is Jesus Christ. He is the only hope. 
is the answer to the disconnect or discontent and the disunity and the rebellion that we see today. He is the life and he is the light that overcomes even this pandemic. He's the depth of God and the only one who by his very presence brings salvation and peace. So now in closing, let's think about creation. Moses told the story of creation. And immediately after the formation of space and matter, the Lord filled the void and the formless earth with light, literal light. Before he even fashioned the physical sources of light on the fourth day, the sun and the moon and the stars, he filled the universe with light, the light of his presence and with truth. Before giving order, dividing day from night and sky from earth and dry land from ocean, the Lord filled every atom with his truth so that everything would reflect his character. The word, Jesus Christ, eternal, infinite, unlimited. He was, he is, and he always will be the maker and the Lord of all that exists. And then amazing grace, amazing grace when he, Jesus Christ, the word, came in the flesh to a tiny spot in the universe called the planet Earth. The mighty creator becoming part of his creation, submitting himself to be limited by time and space and susceptible to age and sickness and death, propelled by love, he came to rescue and to save, offering forgiveness and life. Oh, my friends, he is the word. He is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He's the creator of all things, the life and the light. So my prayer for us this year is that we go deep, that we go deep, that we get to know Jesus in ways that we've never known him before, in ways that we have read stories of him before. And we might say, oh, I have read that one before, but he will re illuminate it. The Holy Spirit will illuminate it. It will come alive. It'll be deeper and greater than we have ever imagined. And so I, my prayer is that we go deep, that we experience the depth of his presence that we experience the all-embracing peace of God, that we will believe in Jesus Christ, that by belief in Jesus Christ, we are saved, that we will have peace in God and peace with God. And so, my friends, thank you for joining me. It's going to be a fabulous study. God's going to do amazing things. He'll transform lives. So thank you. Fight through the technical difficulties. Fight through the feeling of disconnect and know that God is in this moment. He's called us for such a time as this, and he's going to do amazing things. Let me close us in prayer. God Almighty, you are the creator of the heavens. You are the magnificent one. We bow before you and acknowledge that you are indeed God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, that you are the Almighty one. Father, and yet you bend down and you listen to us. You say to us, come to you to call you Abba, Father, Daddy, to run into the throne room of your grace. What a glorious privilege you have given us. So, Father, bless each and every one that hears this message. If they don't know you as Savior, Lord, don't let them wait another moment. But may they come to you knowing that you are the creator the almighty God who created them and wants to give them salvation in life. Father, to you be the glory and the honor and the praise now and forevermore. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you guys for coming and you be sure to come back next week. Bless